Nothing short of a masterpiece. The head is one big pile of shit. All right, I forgot a whippy, a whippy snapper beginning. You just start there. Like, you've already... We get, like, just that's how the episode starts. I forgot a quippy, whippy thing. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, hello, and welcome to Low Expectations, the podcast. <laughs> We're going to teach you how to lower the bar in life so that you'll be disappointed more often. And what better ways to do that than with terrible movies? I am your host, Drew, and with me is my co-host, Liam. Hello. And this month, we are delving into one of my personal favorite movies of all time. Hercules! 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 Speaking of which, we should do Nutty Professor or whatever movie that is. The, like, horrible um, Eddie... Yeah, I think... Why can't I remember his last name? Murphy? Murphy, yes. All I can think was Izzard, and that's a very different person. It is, quite a bit. But, uh, I suppose we could. I'll have to revisit it. I haven't seen it in forever i imagine they don't hold up probably not but we're not here to talk about that hercules we're here to talk about a very very particular hercules one that's hard to find because there's like 90 movies called hercules well and that's actually part of the history that i wanted to talk about um oh yeah there's actually an interesting bit of history behind this so uh right around the late 70s early 80s the italian movie cinema group I don't remember what they're called. Um, but basically, it's like the Italian version of Hollywood. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they figured out that if they can get a bunch of bodybuilders to flex their muscles in Greek outfits and make use of their Italian Mediterranean landscape, that they could just make a killing. Okay. Which was great for them, because up to this point, they were fighting a losing battle against Hollywood. You know, Hollywood was kind of the top dog. Yeah, and they were making spaghetti westerns at the time. Amongst other things. Uh, For example, this particular genre, Hercules, would fall under what is popularly known as sword and sandal films. Right. And uh, actually, it worked so well that Hollywood picked up the ball and started to do it. And so the very first Hercules movie to be made in this style is actually starring Andrew Rees. So it was a Hollywood film. Andrew Rees was one of the first really popular bodybuilders to come out of America. Huh. So, yeah, so now whenever you watch Rocky Horror Picture Show and you hear the doctor make a reference to watching an Andrew Rees movie, now you know what that means. Isn't it Steve Reeves? No, it's Andrew Reeves. Uh, I haven't seen Rocky Horror in a while, but I thought they took in an old Steve Reeves film, that's what he says. No, it's old Andrew Reeves. Oh. Hey, this is Drew in the editing booth. I just wanted to make a quick correction. It turns out Liam was right. It is Steve Reeves' movie, and here is the proof. We could take in an old Steve Reeves movie. All right, and now back to the show. And, yeah, and the reason why it's so scandalous is because the whole purpose um, of Sword and Sandal films was to market to two audiences in particular. Mm Mm-hmm both of whom would be expected to stay at home at the time. So the first audience, obviously enough, is little Timmy, who just wants to see a superhero beat up the bad guys. Right. And is the second audience people who like gratuitous shots of people's butts, men and women? Because that's what this movie was about to me. (laughs) Funny you should say that, because they believed wholeheartedly that the second audience they were trying to pander to was little Timmy's stay-at-home mom, who would most likely watch this movie with him. So Timmy gets the action, mom gets the butt? Yep. Mom just gets dirty, dirty ideas. (laughs) Oh, Hercules, lay me down, you thick, handsome man, you. Speaking of which, why doesn't Hercules have a penis? (laughs) Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on, we haven't opened the spoiler gate yet. Oh, sorry. Spoilers, Hercules doesn't have a dick. <laughs> All right, then. Well, in that case, let's jump into it. Are we Are we going to open the spoiler gates already? Oh, I mean, 
I mean, I'm down with it. Pull that lever. Do it. Warning. The spoiler gate is opening. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. The show will be entering the spoiler zone from here on out. If you do not wish to experience spoilers, please turn off the show now. I repeat, the spoiler gate is opening. All right, so I have to say this movie does not pull any punches from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. This movie is bonkers. It starts off insane, and it keeps the same like intensity of insanity throughout this movie. I had to pause so many times just like, what the fuck am I watching? That's how you know you got a keeper. Oh, yeah. Like, I was, I think, 15 minutes in, and I was like, oh, Drew, you picked a winner on this one. This is gold. <laughs> so, immediately we have a Morgan Freeman wannabe giving the intro. Yeah. And it's weird. I thought, it's like a, if it's an insane person was hosting Cosmos. <laughs> It's like an absolute lunatic wandered onto the set, and Carl Sagan didn't show up on time, so like, just fuck it, let's use this guy. <laughs> you, do you know Greek mythology? <laughs> I saw a Olympus Greek person is... once. Close enough. Go for it. So, fun fact, Olympus is no longer on an easily climbable mountain. It is now oh. on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, on? First of all... The moon was made when Pandora's jar, her, like, disco jar where all the funk in the universe is stored, just explodes for no reason. So, so wait, are you, are you telling me that it was, like, some kind of large boom? Or, like, a... No, no, no. Like, a big... The Big Bang happens first, because that's where chaos comes from, according to our pseudo-Morgan Freeman person. But then Pandora's jar appears before Pandora exists and it's all like 1970s disco teched out and then just blows up and that's how the planets get made oh that's another thing oh speaking of which the only planets that get made are jupiter saturn mercury and earth yeah fuck everybody else and it's like the movie just kind of stops in the middle of this narration it's like saturn the one with the rings jupiter <laughs> It's pretty big. Mercury. <laughs> on fire, I guess. I was like, this has nothing to do with the narration. He's naming, like, the shit eight-year-olds know about planets. Again, sword and sandal. <laughs> but I have to say, one of the other things I absolutely love about this film are the beep-boop sounds. Oh my god, yeah. And, like, like, the lens flares before lens flares were a thing, so they're all rainbowy and, like, uh, prism-y. Oh, this, the, like, you know that they were paying top dollar for post-production oh, yeah. in this entire thing. And, I like, every time I heard the beep-boop sounds, I could not help but think about the advertisement for the Dungeons & Dragons computer board game. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Who knows, maybe if you're lucky, I'll put it in in the post credits it's so good <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah where were we after that oh right so all the all the gods are just kind of chilling out by all the gods on... you mean the three gods zeus hera and um who's who's the third one athena Af or no um athena yeah who sexy warrior princess I mean, Zeus, you can guess it's Zeus, but they don't tell you who the other two are until, like, 40 minutes into this movie. Okay, so that's another theme that's very, very much a thing in this movie, is that you don't get any story until it is way too late for the story. Yeah, it just kind of throws things at you and, like, okay, sure. You just have to sit there and, like, just take it. Just be like, okay, yep, they're crossing a rainbow into hell. Why not? <laughs> Well, that's that's what's so great. You're like, okay, they're doing the thing. Now they're doing the other thing. And then Hark finally at the very late... At... Bond, where the villain is doing something crazy. Yeah, and it's at the very end where they're just like, oh, right, plot. Here you go. Oh, yeah, we should probably try to explain what the hell's going on. 
Oh, okay. Like I said, this movie was written by a lunatic. This are the ravings of a madman. More on that afterwards. This is what I believe will be part of an ongoing theory that we'll have to explore in this in this podcast series. So, but I have my I have my theories about that. We'll cover that back at the end. Anyway, moving on. So apparently, Hera, the one who supports evil, that we don't really realize until halfway through. Yeah, no, I didn't get that at all. I was like, why is this bitch, like, so into demons and such? Like, she's way on the side of evil, but the other guys are just kind of like, I mean, all right, cool. And she's into what she's into. I mean, okay, so granted, yes, Hera naturally worked against Hercules because she's supposedly the wife of Zeus. And Hercules was a love child between Zeus and a human. I get that. So that part is understandable, but no, the movie's just like, nope, we're not getting into that. It's just, Hera's just, nope, fuck everything. I'm evil now. But she's not really evil. She just is like, she just supports evil. <laughs> Give evil a chance. Like, she doesn't actively go out of her way to do bad things. She's just like, all right, Zeus, you go handle all the heroes. I'm going to take care of the villains. We'll split it down the middle. It'll be oh, good. Oh, God, she's like Britney Spears' kid. <laughs> Leave evil alone. <laughs> What did evil ever do to you? Uh. So yeah, so she insists that evil's gonna win, and it's either like some kind of wager or some retort. Zeus and Athena are just like, "All right, we'll make a, <laughs> we'll make a human that can fight evil now." Enter the Lou Ferrigno nudie pick. Well, hang on. So they reach into like the core of the moon. And pull out, like, this glowing orb that just kind of floats around space until it makes a blue skeleton. And then it makes Lou Ferrigno completely naked with no dick. He's like a Ken doll. Oh, man. Now I totally need to see if there's a Lou Ferrigno action figure. And if there is, I'm just going to strip him naked (laughs) and put him in a vacuum cover on my top bookshelf. It'll be the most accurate action figure ever made. Like, all right. I'm not... I didn't want to go into this movie and see Lou Ferrigno's dick, but I would like it explained why Hercules has no genitalia. It's for the kids, Liam. Think about the children. Well, then they could have just made him, like, wearing a loincloth. They explicitly make him naked. This is very true. And so they zap him down... Oh, where did they zap him down to? Generic City... No, they zap him down to Thebes, the Martian outpost. (laughs) That's right. I totally forgot. Thebes, for whatever reason, is this, like, glowing red rock fortress in a barren wasteland. (laughs) Which will be known to change several hues from time to time throughout the course of this. Well, they don't ever go back to Thebes. No, that's where the final battle Uh, is, is in Thebes. Because... No, it's on, uh, Theros, the Green Island. They say it, like, nine times. Oh, that's right. You're right. (laughs) But I thought... No, because I thought King Minos was the guy that kills Hercules' father. He is, but he still just chills out in his own kingdom. What a douche. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you know, it was a weekend. Just decided to go mess with Thebes. Whatever. No, he needed that sword for some reason. Oh, because... Because it makes the beep boop noises. Anyway. Oh, gosh, where does it go from there? Oh, right. They beam him down into the newborn, already speaking Hercules. They just kind of force the Hercules essence into the baby. It's kind of gross. In, yeah. Who is, in this version, the son of the king and queen of Thebes. Because, yeah. Yeah. And it also happens to be on the same night that the evil enchantress and King Minos decide, eh, I'm just gonna mess with Thebes tonight. Get me a sword. Yeah, so they send a thief to go into this weird Buddha room to steal the Buddha sword. Like, I I think those statues were supposed to be Giannis, but they were very obviously Buddha. Well, you know, you say potato, I say potato. Island deities, whatever. <laughs> well, we'll get to that when they get teleported to oh, Easter geez. Island. That's oh, so good. And so they make a point of killing the king and queen so that nobody will rebel against them. And they're like, oh, they had a baby. Maybe we should kill that too. So the commander comes and he's like, all right. And I see you've killed the king and queen. Good. Did you kill the baby? And his left hand is like, no, I left that extreme pleasure for you. Like, 
hey, Captain, know how much you get off on murdering babies? <laughs> you seem like a guy who should be leading this group. Hmm, <laughs> yes. Murdering babies. It's like the only thing he loves. Well, that's all we know about him at, yep. basically at the beginning of the movie. That is that is the character development. That, that, hey, this is Captain Minos. He likes killing babies yep. and stealing swords. Yeah. He stabs an empty crib, and then we don't see him ever again. At least not that version of him. Then we get then we get senile Minos. Yeah, we get a new guy. And then they say, oh no, where did he go? And then we get the maiden running with a sack of potatoes that is clearly supposed to be a child, but is also clearly a sack of potatoes. Oh my god. And she's running through like this swampy river area and they didn't turn off their microphones and put in sound effects later. So it's just this cameraman like running through swampland <laughs> making squelching noises with every step. And then when they finally do cut to her, she's it looks like she's trying to hold a baby, but the baby is like in a burlap sack and it's kind of lumpy. <laughs> almost potato y like. Yeah. And, like, if this really was a newborn baby, she would definitely have been shaking it to death. Oh, man. But anyway, baby survives by basically rocking off the bottom of Niagara okay. Falls. Okay, hang on. So, she puts him on a boat in the river, and then the guards kill her, and the boat starts floating down the river, and the guard's like, No, let the river kill the baby. Even though, apparently, that's awesome. Killing a baby is sweet in this universe. They're like, no, no, no. River earned this one. Okay? MVP award goes to... <laughs> River. So, yeah. It's... And it's weird because there's multiple shots of this, like, just lazy river with a boat and a baby on it. And the baby's just like, yeah, I'm on a boat. I'm riding down this river. Whatever. And then all of a sudden, giant waterfall. Like, straight up hard cut. Oh, yeah. And then the best part, the baby's about to plummet to his death when giant, weird water hand comes out of nowhere and is like, I'll save you, baby. It comes out It comes out slowly, like finger by finger. And at first I thought it was just the actual movie flipping me off. Like, just <laughs> fuck you for watching this. I laughed so I'm like, what is happening? And then like the other fingers come in. I'm like, oh, it's a hand catching the boat. I would have such respect for any director who just out of nowhere has a hand come out of nowhere and it's like, fuck you. <laughs> I got your money. What are you going to do? Needless to say, that was the intervention of Zeus and Hera bitches about it. And so then he has to wreck the boat anyway. But they get found by a wonderful... Old village couple. Oh, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You forgot. So, uh -oh. Zeus puts the babe back in the river on the other side of the waterfall, and Hera gets all pissed off. And it's like, you cheated. So, dick monsters, go. And she summons... Leave like, evil alone! She summons, like, these two, like, tentacle dick monsters. Oh, that's right. The eels. I, they're, I mean, those are some messed up looking eels. Yes. Yes, they are. And they swim up to his boat, and their eyes glow and make the beep-boop noise, and baby Hercules, like, smashes it, I guess. I don't know, it's really weird, because it's just... Hercules smash. It's just a baby, like, grabbing at rubber snakes, just fumbling in the dark, because it's like a two-year-old. You can't direct a two-year-old. I would have loved to have been a fly in the wall of that... that particular scene. Oh, recording. I would not. I imagine that would be so horribly frustrating. Of just the director like, God damn it, kid, just grab the snake! I imagine that shot took all day. But yeah, so needless to say, Hercules manages to thwart the the serpents. Gets picked up by this loving old couple. And then we get the first scene of many of these scenes where it hard cuts to the moon and the very the three actors who play these gods just kind of vacantly staring into the middle space, and then we cut back to whatever was going on. Like clearly, it was like we got to bump this up to eighty minutes. Come on, what can we do? We've got that B roll. <laughs> Come on, Zeus, just just like look at a thing for a couple of seconds. We'll, we'll kill some time. It's the movie equivalent of adding an extra space after a period in an essay to make it look longer. It's like good. Keep looking. Keep looking. Nope. I know it's awkward, but we're going to cut it into snippets. Just keep looking. 
Okay, good. Good. We're going to zoom in now and scene. Yeah, so then we go back. Crazy narrator comes back to talk about Hercules growing up just to justify another hard cut. <laughs> and in the future, where now Hercules is Lou Ferrigno, and he's just toiling away at this weird, like, spinning rock. I think it's supposed to, like, be grinding uh, grain. But Yeah, I think it's a mill. I think it's a mill, but it's never explained. You never see him use it for anything. He's just pushing this thing. Also, they live in a giant stone mushroom. Haters gonna hate. Yeah, I mean... Mushroom's gonna mush. I, I'm, I'm jealous. I guess that's what it boils down to. I want to live in a giant stone mushroom. We also find out that his adopted parents also decided to name him Hercules. What a twist! I know, it's like, wow, we found this baby. He reminds me of that kid that was murdered in Thebes the other day. Let's name him after that. And then we get to what is arguably one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie, which is just the entire durations of the woodland scene. So after all this weird growing up, him turning into Lou Ferrigno... The first real scene where we get interaction with Lou Ferrigno is where he goes into the woods with his father to chop down some trees. And by chop down, I mean just rip out of the ground. <laughs> and, and the best part is just how they how they intro it. You know, you don't see him walk up to a tree. It's just, oh, look, there's a tree. Now there's some burly arms around it. Oh, look, it's not in the ground anymore. Yeah, it actually took me a second to realize that he and his dad were doing chores of cut of like chopping firewood. I thought Lou Ferrigno was just out in the woods ripping trees out of the ground for the hell of it, just because he's Hercules and why the hell not? Yeah, I mean, if I was Hercules, that's what I would do for fun. Yeah, I mean, like his maybe this is his rebellious teen years. I mean, he's like, "Fuck you, Dad! I'm going out in the woods to knock over trees. What are you gonna do about it?" But no, they just had a mutual understanding. Hercules rips out the trees. Dad actually turns it into useful lumber. <laughs> yeah. Never mind the fact that Hercules could probably do this by himself. Yeah, he'll be just, like, snapping these trees over his knee. I guess Dad has to be useful for something. Yeah, it's important to feel like you're contributing. Like, plot development. <laughs> Enter the bear. As far as I see it, there's really two bears in this scene. There's the B-roll footage of a bear growling, and then there's a guy at a Dime Store Halloween bear costume. <laughs> Oh, I love Bear Costume Guy. And, He's amazing. And you only ever get glimpses of him so that you think so that you get fooled, supposedly, into thinking it's the same bear. But seeing it as Such B roll bear, bear growling is is clearly like a bear on all fours, and Bear Costume Guy is up on two feet the whole time. You can't not miss Bear Costume Guy. It's like just think of dressing your kid up like a teddy bear for Halloween and then put that on an adult that is what this guy like he might as well have just draped a bear skin rug over himself and been like oh I'm a bear look at how scary I am and so naturally the man who can't rip trees out of the ground is also no match for a man in a plushy bear <laughs> costume <laughs> and so he dies with glorious splendor and Hercules hears it from very far away which I have something to say about the measurements of distance in this film, for one thing, but we'll get back to that in a second. Dude, really, that's what you want to bring up about being ridiculous with this film? It's the little things. I mean, if it's going to be super over the top, I'm more than okay with it. But if it's something like, oh, we have to go to the deepest, deepest ocean, and we can clearly see him falling down to the bottom and jumping back up... Well, not even that. They dump him in the ocean, and you can you watch him fall from the top of the waterline to the floor of the ocean, which takes about two seconds because the floor of the ocean is about four feet down. Wait, okay. Sorry. We're getting ahead of ourselves. There's just too much awesome. <laughs> so anyway, he hears him from far away, runs back. Bear costume man is still there, as well as B-roll bear. <laughs> and he does some... Batman original television series style punches and defeats them both. He he does the Kirk double axe handle punch too. He which does. I'm always a fan. Anytime you manage to get the double axe handle in there. So good. So good. But then he goes and he sees his father clearly has suffered from eating too much ketchup. <laughs> Just got it everywhere. 
died of ketchup overload. Which I'm actually surprised it's the only blood we see in the movie. Yeah, you're right, because his mother doesn't have blood, does she? No! I can't even figure out what kills his mother. Anyway, well, well, let's finish this and then we can get to mom. Yeah, mom's not far off. Oh, she's she's gonna get it. But, uh, yeah. So, best part in the scene, by far, Hercules finds Ketchup Explosion Dad, immediately blames the bear for no particular reason, gets super fits of rage, you just see his hands come up and then down, hard cut to the planet Earth, and then... <laughs> Just out of nowhere, you see this, <laughs> and it's not B-roll bear, it's bear costume bear, just flying through space, <laughs> second star to the right, oh straight God. on till morning. That is my favorite scene in this movie, hands down, But wait, when he hucks this bear into space. But wait, there's more. <laughs> After going second star to the right straight on till morning, he hits said star and then bounces around the constellations pinball style to form what I think... Ursa Major. Okay, I was making sure that's what it was supposed to be. Yes, it's Ursa Major. <laughs> and I, I can't express this enough. It's not B-roll bear. It's guy in bear costume just doing cartwheels through space <laughs> forming Ursa Major. <laughs> which I'll have to say I'm actually very impressed with because, um, you know, they did a lot of really impressive things with their post-production. I don't think you could take a figure of a guy and spin him around, so I really want to believe that they had him on a green screen strapped to something, spinning, spinning him, him around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be what it was. It's perfect. Like, all right. Normally, I'm like, watch this movie because it's great. If you hate this movie, stick through it until you get to see him huck a bear into space. And I would have to say that that's probably also the best propaganda to get people to watch this film. And I'm pretty sure that yeah. scene is also on YouTube. In which case, it, I may put it, it in definitely. the show notes. No, make them watch the whole movie. Okay. Fine. Don't give them. Don't give it to them for free. Make them earn that shit. Okay. So, guys, what you just heard, forget it. I didn't say it was on an easily searchable website. You have to go actually search out the actual movie. <laughs> so yeah, he takes Dad back home. No, he just kind of leaves Dad there. No, he leaves Dad in the woods. You cut to him. I think he's supposed to be plowing the or like tilling the field. <laughs> but That's right. And he's not tilling it with a regular till. He's got like a boulder with a wedge on he's it. He's got three rocks attached by a log that he's just dragging. <laughs> And the thing is, he's in, like, a mountainous hillside. Like, you would never plant things here. Also, his boulders are digging way too deep. It's like, I thought he was digging a grave for his dad in the style of a mass grave. And, of course, somewhere in the middle of this, we have yet another hard cut back to the moon. Where... Oh, yeah. With the gods absentmindedly, like, ah, oh, look at him dig things. And then they mention King Minos again, like, oh, Minos, 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 something, something, Minos. Yeah. About his evil sorcery, or whatever. I, I don't know. I don't get it at all. <laughs> they, well, they call it science. More on that later. Yeah. Like, I, I don't even know how to begin on that part. <laughs> but naturally, after they talk about him, it gives him a perfect excuse for another hard cut to... Daedalus in some weird cave. And this is probably my second favorite scene because this is where you clearly figure out that new King Minos... Well, for starters, this isn't King Minos from the very beginning attacking Thebes. Totally new actor. Yeah. And this guy is just clearly off his rocker. And nothing says that better when he just stands there, looks around like he's a boss, and then, j like, is a perfectly normal thing to do. Just kind of stands there and shouts... Daedalus! Alright, pause for a second. First of all, he's on yet... He's on a different moon, it appears. Because he's just, like, on some sort of rocky outcropping in space with, like, four moons behind him. Yes. Like, he's on planet Zarbon, just doing this, and he yells out Daedalus. When he does that, I, honest to God, thought he was doing the thing from Beetlejuice... Dale! Dale! 
I I really thought like this movie is so insane that if that had happened, I wouldn't have questioned it. I'd be like, yep, that's a thing that can happen in this universe. Why not? Well, and the best part is he says it like a second time, doesn't get through it the whole way, and then this random I kind of want to say hot chick, but she's also kind of really freaky too. Yeah, it was it's like that um that sort of style in the 80s where, you know, the person is attractive, but what they're wearing makes them look like they've escaped from a mental asylum. I want to say that this is kind of where Lady Gaga got her inspiration from. Oh yeah, there's, was... it's either that or Minos' daughter, who's always wearing a dress where you can just see the top of her nipples spilling out of whatever she's wearing. No, that wasn't Minos' daughter, that was um, the Enchantress. I forget her name, but she was actually a sorceress or an enchantress who's supposed to win him over. More on that later, because that was a terrible strategy. Uh, no, I think that's his daughter. It was the princess. But there's the enchantress, and there's the princess. No, that's that's not Minos. The enchantress starts off as like that sea witch. That's not King Minos. And then yeah, blood. that's not King... Yeah, Minos has a daughter who is always spilling out of whatever dress she's wearing. No, that's the other guy. We'll get on to that in a second. We're almost there. Alright. No, that's that's some king that we never see again after that, because Minos kidnaps her. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the virgin that they're going to sacrifice. Like, that's a third chick who is just usually wearing things that just cover her nipples. I'm talking about the evil daughter, also a magic user, but not an enchantress. I think we're thinking about the same person. I think, I think listeners, that we are getting through you how confusing and insane this movie is that two people who have recently watched it can't agree on who the hell these people are. So good. Anyway, Daedalus comes out and everybody knows the story of Daedalus, right? Like builds the labyrinth, gets stuck in it with his son, Icarus, builds Icarus a pair of wings so that he can fly away. Icarus flies too close to the sun, the wax on the wings melt and he falls to his death and Icarus is sad forever and ever the end, right? Crazy old guy, builds Labyrinth, suffers for it. All gone. Not what happened. Daedalus is now the master of some weird sorcery called Science, who's also a hot chick, but also has a really freaky cod piece and cape. And her helmet, I'm sure, gets all 57 channels. Her helmet is like something out of the Golden Era comics in Marvel. Like, just wings coming off of stuff yes. for no reason. Just bonkers that's all i can say about everything in this movie it's nuts loki's got nothing on that shit oh no she's like pissed off that he summons her because it's like are we gonna go kill the gods with science he's like not yet i need to take care of this one thing he also says that he doesn't believe in the gods but he's not above working for them right and i think that's what is supposed to piss her off she's like wait you said we we're gonna go kill the gods but you're like hold on i gotta do a favor for them real quick just further shows just absolutely how senile King Minos is at this point. And from ever forward, it is so good. He's just stupid crazy. Anyway, it turns out that Hera hires Minos to take out Hercules. He decides to do this by working with Daedalus. And Daedalus says, you know what the best way to do this is? With dollar store toys. <laughs> and just like in Power Rangers... I'm going to throw them from planet Zarbon, and when they enter the atmosphere, they'll get huge. Oh, that's right. She totally pulls a Rita Repulsa. She does, but, like, they explain it as if that should make sense to the viewers at home. Like, oh, yeah, you know, atmospheric pressure. When they enter the atmosphere, they'll grow larger, like everything does. You didn't know that's how that works? <laughs> nope. That one, I just must have tuned out when they taught me that one in school. Clearly, you are unfamiliar in the ways of science, sir. Clearly. So this is where we get to the first of the mechanical monstrosities, which looks like... It's a giant robo-clockwork moth. Yeah, I was going to say, like, imagine, like, a Chinese knockoff of a Mothra toy, and then it also winds up so it has moving parts, and yeah. it's really cheap plastic that they spray-painted some, like, metallic copper color... Mm-hmm. And she, it just kind of flies down to where Morning Hercules and Mom are. 
Well, hang on. We didn't even get to... So, last we left Hercules, he's tilling the fields. And then an unnamed character that I decided to call Frendicles. Frendicles comes down and is like, Your mom's in trouble! So, Lou Ferrigno, Hercules, goes running off to his stone mushroom. And mom's just dead. Like, no reason. There's, like, nothing's disturbed. She's just lying next to the mushroom, dead. And then the moth comes over the horizon. So, here's the thing. I'm sure they wanted us to think it was the moth, but I'm pretty sure it was Frendicles. Just saying. Oh, yeah. Frendicles is like, thank God there was a moth here to explain this shit. And I take it Hercules was never troubled with an overabundance of schooling. <laughs> As everybody knows, the best way to kill a moth is with a giant wood pole. I mean, this is just... The director was like, all right, Lou Ferrigno, what can we do with him? He's a big dude. Let's just have a bunch of situations where he'll have to pick up heavy things. And I can remember, like, what does he... He, like... He just beats the moth with it for a while. And they keep, like, showing cuts of the moth's, like, pincers closing. Yeah. And, it... and then the blog keeps breaking and getting smaller. And I think we're supposed to believe that it's, like, breaking the log off in its mouth, even though he's just smacking it in the side. Oh, that's what it was. He dives under it, and that's when he gets it, right? On the underside? No, he just hucks his, uh, like, wood-cutting axe into the thing's skull, and it falls over and dies. Oh, okay. That's right. Man, how did I forget all this stuff? It's probably just because the whole thing just... I mean, I had to sit down and really think after I watched this, and like, all right, what happened in this movie? I mean, I've watched it so many times that it's hard for me to count them all, but... Luckily, I just watched it, so it's pretty fresh in my mind. But yeah, so he kills the moth, and then he builds a funeral pyre for his mom, so at least she gets something. And then he goes and takes the torch and just hucks it into the stone mushroom, which immediately catches on fire. And friend the Cleese is all like, what are you doing? You're burning down your house! And he's like, I don't have a house anymore. Like, yeah, because you set it on fire. That's, that's called arson. <laughs> Thank God insurance fraud isn't a thing yet. So, he decides, well, I'm not going to live here anymore. My only plot device is keeping me here gone. Except for Frendicles, whatever. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm going to go make my fortune elsewhere. Hard cut to a gladiatorial arena. In a cave. And this is another thing, like, anytime you're in a city in this movie, it's being shot in a cave. Like, clearly the people of Greece all live underground. I'm... I'm willing to put money that this is the exact same cave with just different set pieces in it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's in the, like the cave set pieces are again, like original series, Star Trek set pieces for like an alien planet. Well, they had to do something with them. I guess they had them lying around. Maybe they could get it on the chief. Ugh. And so overprotective Dadocles. <laughs> yeah, we don't get his name either. He's king over protective Dadocles. Is having a competition for men to go through all of these really stupid challenges to try and figure out who is going to protect daddy's little girl. Yeah, escort her to another city. And Lou Ferrigno is just like killing people with a sword that for whatever reason makes laser noises and effects whenever he like hits another sword. It's the beep boop sword. It's one of the many, many it beep is. boop swords. It's not the raddest, like, King Minos has the raddest beep boop sword in all of the land, which ironically is not the one he steals at the beginning of the movie. No, no it's not. That is a completely different beep boop sword. But again, we get ahead of ourselves. So, enter Hercules. They were getting ready to close it down because, lo and behold, the last challenger died for the night, and they're like, oh, well, there's nobody left. And then Hercules is like, oh, wait, 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 sorry, I'm late. Here, is this the is this the part where I beat up the bad guys? Beat up bad guys, he does. Oh, and it's just, the different stupid things he has to do are just so wonderfully stupid. So, he has to fight two people at once as his first test. Which, you know, he's Hercules, so he beats the shit out of them. Then he has to fight two chariots at once. No, 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 no. First he has to fight, like, a whole swath of men. No no, that's the last challenge. Oh, I thought the chariots were the last challenge. Okay. It would make more sense, because, like, they're like, all right, one more test. 
This one's a real doozy. Damn it, Liam, don't you talk to me about sense here. It, it's a real doozy of a test, because you know how we just made him, like, fight the equivalent of war machines for this era? Let's see if he can fight, like, 20 scrawny dudes. Totally won't expect it. Take him completely by surprise. Yeah. So, he yanks the chariots apart. The blades on the wheels just hit him in the shins and shatter. And the horses run off dragging the chariot drivers. And he's like, I beat your test, what now? And the king's advisor is like, 20 scrawny dudes! So 20 scrawny guys come out, and he just picks up a log that's sitting next to the challenge arena, hits them all with the log until they give up, and then hucks the log into space! First log on the moon. <laughs> no, it's Jupiter. Take that, Armstrong. He throws it to Jupiter. I know, because they'd spend time specifying which planets were which. <laughs> But, again, there's a pretty, it's a pretty long scene of this log traveling to Jupiter. <laughs> and it's, like, it looks like uh, the probe in Star Trek. Um, God, what's the one where they go back in time to San Francisco? Because there's a probe that wants to talk to whales. The Voyage Home. I don't... Yes, okay. Yeah, it looks like the probe from Voyage Home just floating through space until you see that it's on a collision course with Jupiter. <laughs> And I honestly expected Jupiter to explode when the log hit it. It would have been, that's you know honestly that's probably where the big red eye came from. <laughs> probably. It's just a sore spot from the log. <laughs> it's a black eye from the log that Hercules hucked into it. So he does all this incredible super strength stuff, and he's like, "Okay, can I do it now?" And one more King... test. Well, this is the thing, King King Overprotective Datacles is like, "Yeah, okay, that was pretty good," and then. It's his associate who kind of looks like, oh god, I don't know what he looks like. He's got super bald head. Yeah, I don't. He just looks like a. I mean, he just looks like stock advisor man. Yeah, he says, "No, we have to make him do one more task." Oh yeah, it's what if he's evil? We have to test for evil. And what better way to test for evil than to muck a stall? Which, you know, credit to them clearing the Stygian wastes or whatever. Is it the Stygian wastes? I don't know. I remember this is actually one of Hercules' challenges. He has to clean the yes. stable. Yes, and, and to the credit of the film, this is probably the most accurate part of the entire movie. Like, this, like how he solves the problem. It's what happens the wager in he the makes. original Hercules legend. Yeah, this is the most accurate part. Why would you make the most accurate part? The part where Hercules cleans the poop? I don't know. So is that what you want to focus on? But, you know, like I said, you're a fucking lunatic, so go crazy. That being said, I also want to touch on this scene a little bit, too, because oh, this... Oh, yeah. I want to talk about it. <laughs> How he diverts the river. And for those of you listening at home, I'm making air quotes. That's good radio right there, Liam. I know, that's perfect radio. Yeah, so I, I want you to picture the Grand Canyon yep. with a part where the Colorado is flowing through it. Now I want you to put two, okay, fairly big-sized boulders into it. Again, he just hucks these boulders down this cliff into the river. Sure, you would expect it to rise a little bit, but we're talking about the Grand fucking Canyon. But no, two boulders, that's all it takes, just he two. floods the countryside. <laughs> And washes out the entire stalls. Yes, this is how it happens in the actual story. No, this is not going to work with something the size of the Grand Canyon. Just not gonna. Even if it did, have you ever seen pictures of somewhere after there was a flood? I wouldn't really call it clean. But, but lo and behold, the water of the Colorado River must be holy water because damn if that stall isn't sparkling at the end. Also, once it's done, like, once the river is done flowing through the stall and cleaning it, it also undiverts, whatever the word for that is. It goes back to its normal flow. I guess he must have gone down there and moved those two boulders. Sure. Why not? Why not? Also, they add in post-effect sparkles on the stone to let you really oh. know it's clean. Oh, no, the whole the whole post-production effects on on cleaning the stalls is one of my all-time favorite effects. It's what I call the werewolf effect. The what effect? The werewolf effect. I want you to think back... Oh, yeah, where they did... Like, to, like, the, the original, right, the original the, wolf, wolf man. Now he's a full wolf. 
Yeah, like the original Wolfman scenes. Yeah, from, they like, use the that a black lot and white movies. Movie. Yeah. Oh man, I'm I'm so happy that they decided to divert all of their money from actual production to post production because uh-huh. we get terrible, terrible, cheap <laughs> scenes with the state of the art post production effects that the eighties can buy. <laughs> the early eighties too. And the result is unbelievable. For example, the werewolf change from shitty stalls to goddamn alabaster stalls. Also, there are no horses in these stalls. Like, there's no reason to muck the stalls. It's supposed to contain the goddess's 1,000 horses. No horses. Nope. Are people just importing shit into the stall? You gotta put it somewhere. We can't put it in the river. We use that to clean things. It's also important to mention that he does this because he'll get to see overprotect King Overprotective Dadocles' daughter's face. Because she wears a veil. Which, I have to point out, the veil is hilarious because it is too tight on her face. And it keeps getting sucked <laughs> into her mouth when she talks. <laughs> and nose bubbles when she breathes out. <laughs> Like, like you can he, really see the actress like spitting it out of her mouth every time she has to deliver a line. And you just you just know that had to be taken in one take. Just oh like, yeah, because that thing would get so dirty so fast. Yeah, we're not going to do a second take of that. That was good. Yep, you'll learn how to breathe in it eventually, even though you won't have to use it for the entire rest of the film. <laughs> what do you think I am? Made of money? I can just do takes a second time? This is all going to post production, baby. Those swords aren't going to beep and boop by themselves, you know. Because <laughs> swords don't beep and boop. So yeah, so he wins the bet, gets to see her face, and immediately gets subdued with, was it tranquilizer? Or is it a spell? It's Zeus. Zeus That's right, he gets... a goddamn lightning bolt. Because he's right. about to kiss her. And we can't have that. This is a PG film. I, I honestly, I don't understand why that happens because he has some sort of like monologue about how i i had to do it or else something even worse would have happened like, well, it's it's going i think the implications there is that he just wouldn't hear the end of it from Hera. leave evil alone i guess i i don't know it but yeah so zeus strikes him down for no apparent reason and enter the evil enchantress from the beginning and wouldn't you know it? Minos' daughter. Is it Minos' daughter? Yes. Okay. So we were talking about the same person. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But lo- wouldn't you know it, he's working with stock ambassador type. Yeah, Advisor Cleese. <laughs> advisor Cleese. Like, Advisor Cleese was secretly evil the whole time. No. Nuh-uh. Yep. And so... They take her away to be sacrificed because she's a virgin because of overprotective Dadocles. And they take him away and they dump him in, quote, the deepest reaches of the ocean. All right, this is where I get into the particulars about distance. Yeah. That ocean couldn't I, have been... So you see you see Lou Ferrigno wrapped up in chains get thrown into the deep end of a pool. I was going to say... There is no way that could have been any more than 12 feet deep. I'm willing to say 10. Oh, it tends to stretch, man. That was like 6 feet, maybe. Well, 6 feet is... Like Lou Ferrigno. Lou Ferrigno could have stood up and his hairline would have been almost touching the water. Okay, fair enough. So... And the worst part is, like I said, the camera follows him as he breaks the water's surface... And hits the bottom, so you can really so, see the depth. Yeah. Like, I'm not a fan of the hard cuts in this movie. We have a lot of them. This is one of the times you might have wanted to go for a hard cut. Damn it, Liam. Stop talking sense. <laughs> I know. I, I can't bring logic into this madman's ravings. Logic is dangerous. It leads to science. <laughs> and science kills gods. <laughs> but yeah, so... The whole the whole thing 
if they're going to the deepest reaches of the ocean and it's in the shallows, according to this movie, I should just be able to walk from here to Europe. More or less, you know? Like, yeah, I could do a little bit of swimming. But whenever I get tired, I could just sink and just keep walking. Yeah. Give my arms a break. Speaking and of then... swimming. <laughs> yes, they show him jump back up through the water. And by jump back up, I mean just stand up in the shallows. Like, he does that triumphant, like, burst out of the water, like, yes! And... He you does can tell he's standing, and the water's only coming up to about his waist. It's clearly a "Have you seen my beach ball pose?" Oh yeah, it's about this big. Again, amazing radio. Come on, if you if you don't know what that is, I'm sure you can do a Google search for it. <laughs> Today's broadcast brought to you by Google. Totally gonna put a ding in there. So. Lufrigno Hercules starts swimming, and according to our narrator, he swims for seven days and sweat seven nights. And I'm a big fan of this scene because um, muscle is super not buoyant, and so big bodybuilders like that actually have a really difficult time swimming, and it shows in this scene as he just frantically dog paddles. Well, that, and I can't imagine his reach is very good either, because all of that shoulder muscle getting in the way, he'd be, like, oh yeah, knocking against his head and going unconscious, like, two strokes in. <laughs> but he eventually makes it to some island, kind of walks around like a drunk for a while, and then passes out on the sand, and then McTutcherson is back! Oh, wait, sorry, this is a Greek film. McTutchicles. <laughs> McTutchicles. <laughs> well, don't, don't right, know who she is. Is summoned by Athena. Athena just kind of appears, staring vacantly into the middle distance again, and is like, Hercules. And then she fades out, and McTouchicles just appears out of thin air. And she spends a good, awkward five seconds just kind of going all over her face and making weird noises, like, Yes, I'm going to get you tonight. And again, like, she's in a old, like, witch. She's all witchy and has, like, various sea debris all over her. I mean, it's a good sea witch costume, actually. I, I liked this one. Yeah, it was pretty solid. Yeah. Not so much a fan of her costume change in a few minutes. We'll get there. We'll get there. So Hercules wakes up and is like, Oh, hey, Metechicles, that's kind of creepy. Stop it. And she's like, oh, no, um, mm, uh, Athena sent me, come with me. Athena materialized me out of nothing. And so they go back and Athena basically then tells her to help him out. And she's like, okay, well, I'll help you. Oh, nope, that was a lie. He takes a nap or something, right? In McTouchicles' house? No, he eats all her food. That's right. And he's like, well, I'll help you, but I need your blood. Don't ask me why. She needs ten drops of it. And so she pulls out a knife. Well, actually, at first she just, like, tries to stab that's, him. That's what it was. There's some... And then he's like, the fuck are you doing? And she's like, I need ten drops of your blood. I was like, oh, just ask, bitch. <laughs> and so she stabs him with her little dinky knife, even though the chariot blades just shattered on his shins. Apparently, if he wants to be stabbed, people can stab him. And so she puts it into a goblet and drinks it. Cue classic werewolf transformation number two. <laughs> this one goes on for a while. <laughs> oh, they... Again, we needed to bump it up to 80 minutes. Yeah. they. So she goes through about seven transformation stages. So good. And she slowly morphs into, I guess, a, what's supposed to be really hot. I don't know. It was the 80s. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. She kind of looked like um, Penelope Cruz to me. Kind of, yeah. Except more 80s. Yeah, a lot more 80s. Because she does a costume change as well as a transformation. So she goes from like this robe covered in seaweed and broken rope to a solid gold bikini and sparkly high heels. And now that she's all hot and sassy, she's like, all right, let's get to work. And takes her to, what's the... Is it supposed to be Hades? Is that right? No, no, no. It, it's just straight up hell. Oh, okay. Because they need an amulet that 
Minos and his daughter took from her and hucked into hell. And here's here's a part that I found particularly confusing because the gods it's another hard cut in there somewhere. The gods are just like, well, she found the witch. She's going to fool him into helping her. But it doesn't really look like foolery. It kind of looks like a mutually beneficial enterprise. Like, at no point is anybody being fooled. It's, you get the thing for me, I will help you. Yeah. This is an amulet that lets me teleport off of this godforsaken island. You get it for me, I'll teleport you, and then I'll teleport myself. Like, pretty standard fare for insane Hercules movie. But no, apparently this is trickery. But anyway... So they go in, mm -hmm. enter mechanical monster number two, the Hydra. Yeah, no, it goes back to planet Zarbon. Oh, that's right. Where Dedicles and... No, it's Daedalus and Minos. Minos. Daedalus, whatever her name is. I don't know. If it doesn't end in a Cles, I can't follow it. How could you forget Daedalus? <laughs> because I was expecting it to be... <laughs> The Deo song. Anyway, so they're like, oh, no, they're gonna get the amulet and be able to teleport to our island and stop our evil plans. Like, stop them, Daedalus. And she's like, okay, I got this uh, dragon monster thing. And Minos is clearly... Can I see it grow? <laughs> I just, just, I just want to see. Just, just one. Yeah, he's like, come on, just do this for me. Just like, just make it grow, babe. Come on. And she's like, Fine. Yeah, like he's so, he's seriously like getting off to it more than killing babies. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah. So she grows it a little bit and then puts it down in this cave. Where it somehow. Eh, you know reasons. But uh, and oh, and the best part is even after it grows, Minus is like, mm, I don't know. And she's like, Oh, by the way, did I mention that it shoots? And I quote, "Cosmic rays of deadly fire." Not cosmic rays, not deadly fire, <laughs> cosmic rays of deadly fire. So I want you to, I want you to imagine the most and, deadliest fire, shoot it into space, and turn it into a in laser. The form of a ray. That's what we're. Oh my! That's what we're shooting here. And and she's like, so you know what that means? And his response: cosmic rays of deadly fire. That means they'll be disintegrated. And so, I guess this is the, probably the most tricksy part of their arrangement, but it's still pretty straightforward. She's like, yeah, I can't go past here. There's a deadly monster. You have to kill it now. And he's like, oh, okay. All right. It's kind of what I do, so but, let's do this. <laughs> but first she's like, here, let me help you. And she magically manifests the shield and sword that we won't see again for the rest of the film. Well, we... We do because he has to use the shield to deflect the cosmic rays. Well, I'm talking about oh, after the fire. monster fight. Like, it's supposed to be his... Oh, yeah, no. Well, I assume they get ruined by the cosmic rays. Probably. Alright, so... This weird three-headed robot dragon tank is just kind of wheeling around in this cave shooting lasers. No, no, Liam. It's and... the Hydra. It's the Hydra, remember? Is it really the Hydra? Because that's what they called I it. Thought... They called it the Hydra, even though it's. I know, no, no. They mentioned that there's a Hydra in this cave, but then Daedalus throws this new monster in, and so the way I interpreted the scene was her robot monster killed the Hydra, and now is like even tougher. Oh, okay, sure. It must have incinerated it with the cosmic with ray, cosmic ray of deadly fire. And that would actually make sense because the Hydra is probably big enough that this cosmic ray shooting thing might have been able to hit it. Because those lasers are just flying around willy-nilly all over this dungeon when it's trying to shoot Hercules. Yeah. It's like, you know, the Enchantress tells him that, she has, that he has to use the shield to reflect the cosmic rays back at him. And my immediate reaction was, yeah, if the dragon can ever fucking hit him, you know... It's like Hercules is like diving for these cosmic rays to try and hit one with his shield to bounce back. I mean, you may as well just go up and smack the thing with your sword. 
or just walk past it because it's not going to do anything to stop you. <laughs> no, wait, stop. I'm really dangerous, I promise. No, come back. Hang on. Maybe I'll hit you with a ray. Just come on. Give me a shot, guys. Even so, Hercules plays along, eventually kills it. Hooray! It does an awesome post-effect, like, melt into the ground. But yeah, here's the thing. She clearly makes a point of saying, Hercules, only you can do this. He kills it by reflecting rays back at it with a shield that she procured. Pretty sure anybody else could have done that. No, I think the part that only he can do is reaching into the life seed. No, but she clearly says you have to kill the monster. It's something only that you can do. Maybe it's because he's the only other person on this island and she doesn't want to do it. So it's like, something you have to do. <laughs> only you can do it or whatever. I don't care. Uh, anyway. Get down there so you can reach into the life seed. It's the little things. It's the little things that <laughs> upset me, Liam. And there's a lot of little things right, in this so movie. Then, so yeah, then they make it to the, to what is it, the life seed they call it? Well, hang on. So they're like, let's go down the endless stairs to the core of the earth. And as they start walking down the stairs, the narrator kind of butts in and is like, meanwhile, on the evil guy's boat, the slave, or the sacrifice girl, she's still chained up. And the evil daughter's like, I'm totally going to sacrifice you. And the slave girl's like, no. Then we cut back to Hercules and the... Uh, Enchantress. McTouchicles. McTouchicles. And the announcer again is like, meanwhile, on the rainbow bridge to hell, and there's walking across a rainbow bridge that leads to hell. I'm like, fuck it. Why not? Just, okay. I'm on board, Hercules. Just throw whatever else you got at me. Why not? Why not have a rainbow bridge to hell? Stairs weren't doing it for you? Okay. Rainbow bridge. Asgard? No, Shit. we're going the other way. Go east for Asgard, west for hell. Makes sense to me. And so they get to it, and it looks like a egg, almost. Yeah. And she's like, all right, so here's the deal. You're going to put your hand in there, go. And he tries to do it, and he's like, ow, it really hurts. Why does this really hurt? No, he tries to do it, and his hand just disappears. But I thought it was... And she's like, oh, yeah, there's a triple barrier. And I guess your hand disappearing is barrier number one. So he's like, all right, broke that one down onto the next barrier. And it's the test of fire and ice, which I believe is actually fairly accurate too, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, so, so he just has to endure the pain of his hand being set on fire and then immediately being dipped into a vat of liquid his nitrogen. Frozen stuff. Yeah. And again, this is an amazing post effect because they cut the screen in half and on one end of this film, they have a hand on fire and on the other hand, they have on the other end they have him holding his arm roughly where that hand should be, and so he's got this weird like his arm's just a little too long and a little offset. And you know, Lou Ferrigno is trying to act, so he's like, "Oh, it hurts so much," but he's like moving his arm, and so it's getting out of sync with the arm that's on fire in the shot on the other side of the screen. And then they basically repeat the process with ice cubes. Yep. And then they make that, like, ice-shattering noise. And I thought that, like, his arms exploded off. <laughs> but no, apparently that was just the magic being like, oh, we got a badass over here, let him through. <laughs> All right, whatever. You, you beat the uh, three barriers then. Also, the barriers are rainbow-colored. There are a lot of rainbows in this movie. Oh, man, top dollar post-production. That's what it's all about. They grab the thing, which clearly looks like a boob. <laughs> just one. Just one boob. Yep. And she's like, okay, so can you take us to Theros now? And she's like, no, I can't. So maybe that was the tricky part? I guess. I guess that was the trick. But she's like, she also says the line that I love of, his magic cancels out my magic. So I can't say all right, well, can you get us close to uh, Theros? Like, yeah, I can totally do that. So she says some magic spell, and they get teleported. And like, this doesn't look like Theros. And like, you're right, it's Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Which, holy, holy racism, Batman. Oh, my God. Enter the king of Africa. The king of Africa. Riding in a lift made of an elephant skeleton. Yeah, at first I was like, wait a minute, are we watching, are we watching 300? No, wait, this is Hercules, right? 
Uh huh. Yeah, he kind of does have the uh, like the Xerxes bling all over him. And yeah, and so I'm just gonna call him Xerxes. Says I uh, know, dude. He's the king of Africa. Give some respect where respect is due. As the only black man in this film. Okay, fine. <laughs> the one he deserves a little credit. The one he black guy in Italy, up, aka the king, the king of, of Africa. Africa. So the one black guy in Italy, aka the king of Africa, <laughs> says, "Oh, I have this magic chariot that can help you get where you need to go." But you got to do a thing for me first. Here, just do this impossible thing. I it was like, "Yeah, enchantress, I hired you to build like a levee or something or Woman, where my like, channel at? A channel, yeah. He wants a channel. He wanted her to build him a channel. Because when you're the king of Africa and you need a channel, do you go to an architect or a witch? I mean, they're pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah. I mean, one uses magic, one uses science. As we know, they cancel each other out. And so this time it's the Enchantress's turn to pull a reader repulsa. It takes Hercules and supersizes him. And he's just like, oh, look at this cliff face. Ka-split. And that's how the channel formed. That's not just any channel. That was him separating Africa from Europe. Oh, that's right. And doesn't the narrator say that to some effect or yep. something? The the narrator like butts it and it's like, and that's why Africa's not connected to Europe anymore. Thanks, Hercules. Back to the show. <laughs> also, so King of Africa sees all the Oh, sorry, go ahead. Also, he wanders out into the ocean and splits a cliff edge that wasn't there in a previous shot. Yes. And then, after that, he just kind of, like, poses in the sunset for a little while before he shrinks back down again. He does that, like, hands on the hip, like, look at my pecs. I just split Africa off from Europe. Yeah, and it's, well, it's totally, like, a zoom-up of his face and then, like, his silhouette in the sunlight. It's the kind of thing I would expect to see on a hipster shirt. Oh, yeah. Also, cue triumphant music. Yeah, so King of Africa sees all this. He's like, okay, you can have the chariot. Oh, by the way, the magic flying horses are gone. Good luck. And so we hard cut back to him regular sized on like a fifth planet. Because this is some weird sci-fi planetoid effect, but not like any of the other weird sci-fi planetoid effects that we've seen so far. And they have to break into a temple... And get this, like, no, they... solid crystal chariot. Yeah, and it, it's, well, it's the magic chariot that used to be ridden by the winged horse in. I think it was, was it supposed to be, like, Apollo's chariot or something to that, like that? No, because I think Apollo's chariot's the sun. Oh, right. But we're yeah. talking about Hercules, though. Yeah, I mean, I could totally, if, if they'd come at me with, all right, we have to ride the sun to Theros. Hop on, Enchantress. I'd have been there. Would have made just as much sense. Like, all right. Sure, why not? Why not? But yeah, no. So they have to break out of the temple. So they just, he just picks a rock, pulls it. The wall comes down. Uh, that's how they fly. It's like, all right, we don't have uh, any magic flying horses that'll take us. This is, so yeah. I will tie a rock this is arguably... to the chariot and huck it into space. <laughs> this is arguably my third favorite scene. I would like to add a colon and then a subtitle to this movie. So it should be Hercules, colon, huck shit into space. Absolutely. Well, the best part is before we get to the actual hucking, it's totally him just bossing the Enchantress around, which will be very important... In just a second, but I just, I just want to, I just want to note where it's basically like, I have an idea, woman, do these things. Oh yeah, it's like, make a rope appear. Okay, understandable. Yeah, like, make me a magic rope. Now tie it around that rock. You gotta hook you know, it. In I space. could tie the rope myself, but no, you do it. You use your magic. Be good for something, woman. <laughs> Tying ropes around rocks is women's work. <laughs> Now go stand in that chariot until I meet you there. And then he hucks it into space. And it just, like, I Wait, believe... Before he hucks it into space, we go to the moon again. Because Hera's bitching up a storm that things aren't balanced. And there's, he gave he gave the good people too much shit again. He was like, fine. Leave evil alone! Fine, I'll make them be in love. Because that's how Entrantresses lose their powers. 
Well, and that's, and that's where I wanted to get to. The moral of the story here is, if you treat women poorly, they will fall in love with you. Yep. Because everything up to this point is like mutually beneficial arrangement until he starts being an asshole. Yeah, what? And then he's like, oh, he's being a jerk. Kind of love it. You know, he is being a jerk in this scene, but I kind of feel for him because I imagine I would also be kind of pissy with this person if I asked to go to an island in Greece and she teleported me to Africa. Like, I'm not saying his being a jerk is, like, unjustified. Yeah, like, I feel like... I'm just saying that, like, what is this, what is this saying to little Timmy? That being said, I don't think that the writers of Hercules really spent a lot of time wondering if they were sending a message, let alone the correct message. So we'll get back to this in a second, because A, you're quasi wrong, and B, <laughs> and B, this will go back to my theory on what makes a truly spectacular bad movie that we're going to have to explore more in this podcast. So teaser number okay. two, wait for it. But anyway, <laughs> so they, yeah, so they fly through the this chariot via rock through but, outer space, which, you know, I'm a, which, which I'm, I'm a comic book nerd and that's how Thor flies. So, all right, I'll take it. I'll yeah, allow but it. Thor has a magic hammer. This is a rock. Yeah, but he still just hucks it and holds on to the end to fly. Sure. I'm saying I'll allow it. But then she falls in love with him and the rope breaks because her magic has worn off. It seems you have enchanted the enchantress, which is another amazing line. Ugh. So, yeah, so he says, okay, well, now I have to go save her now. And hard cut back to King Minos, just in case you were wondering what's happening. He just starts... This is probably one of the most useless scenes in the entire movie. He just talks about, you know, give science a chance. And screw the gods. Yeah, it's it's really weird because, you know, he's promoting actually some good things of like you know let's break away from the religious dogma and start you know practicing science and learning about things and he's talking about how the world is chaotic and we have to do things to order it and understand it which as a scientist myself like okay i actually understand what you're saying and i kind of agree with you but he's but you're also let's use magic to make science work and I'm just like, what is going on? And you also have to remember, everything we've seen from him up to this point is him just being super crazy senile. Pretty much just an old man sitting in his own filth, occasionally yelling, science! Right, and so he has, like, the super, like, moment of intelligence where he actually makes a good case for Give Science a Try really awkward long pause yeah it's this weird so yeah weird thing. yeah so and then yeah so he gets through his spiel doesn't say anything for like a good seven seconds and then he's like where was i right hercules go do this thing yeah yeah oh my god <laughs> like he has a pause it's like it's like for a second the writer had a moment of lucidity and I'm like, wait, what am I doing with my life? No, I need to like actually get an important message out there before the Hercules takes back <laughs> Hercules. <laughs> yeah. And so then he's like, Oh, Hercules, right. My daughter go do this and this and this and this. That even though King Midas is all like gung ho on science, he never does anything even remotely scientific. Whoa, 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 whoa. He uses the beep boop sword. Okay. The beep boop sword is magic if I've ever seen magic. What are you talking about? It spits. That is pure. No, 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 wait, wait, Sorry. Wait. Don't spoil the beep boop sword. <laughs> Sorry, I'll make sure I bleep over that. <laughs> Even our spoilers get spoiled. <laughs> So yeah, we cut back, and apparently, even though they were just on the beach, and he walks into a cave, we zoom. I'm assuming. Oh, wait, whoa, whoa, hang on, hang on, hang on. So when they get thrown off of the chariot because the rope broke, they fall into the ocean, and probably my second favorite scene in the movie 
you know, after she has that line about how her magic broken because you've enchanted the enchantress, it's like, well, at least we're almost to Theros. Look over there! And they're, like, swimming in, like, this is really nice blue ocean, blue sky. It's, like, sort of shot in, like, the Caribbean. Hard gut. Cut to another goddamn planet! Black sky, green water. Just green everything. Foreboding evil fortress just floating in the ocean. <laughs> and it's supposedly just over there with a point. <laughs> it's a completely different planet. Yeah, hard cut. So they go back. Apparently, wherever they walk through, they're now there. And then the last mechanical beast comes up and he goes back to Daedalus and is like, okay, yeah, you're done. Won't see you again until the second movie. Okay, bye. He's like, I promise I won't call you unless we're going to kill the gods. All right? And she's like, yeah, you better. And he's like, no, I mean it this time. She's like, okay, fine. And disappears. She does that, like, flip the cape over her face and disappear thing. Ah, uh, post-production. Anyway. So, this time it's a griffin thing? It's the robot centaur. Oh, that's right. With, with a bow. And we go back to killing it with the log, right? Well, first of all, it sneaks up on them. But thankfully, the Enchantress sees it before it can shoot Hercules in the back. So she takes the laser bullet for him. And probably Herc dies. Yeah, and dies. And then he goes over and picks up, like, just a log off of the beach and just beats the centaur with it until it breaks. He's like... Which I imagine was like Daedalus on planet Zarbon when she's making these things for King Midas. Like, all right, so what's he got in his arsenal? He's super strong. Nah, he's probably not going to beat it with things. It should be fine. Let's go. Well, like I said, they're just dollar store toys. I don't know like what she was expecting. I don't know. And so if at this point in the movie you're really confused as to what the hell is going on. At this point? Well, I was going to say... I'm confused the entire movie. Right, so, it, yeah. Again, it's not your fault. It's because they actually haven't explained the plot yet. And here it comes. Hard cut. Oh, hard yeah. cut from Killing the Centaur. King Minos basically has a giant scene telling his daughter to go woo Hercules using this magic do-whatever-I-tell-you-to serum. Oh, no, no, wait. You're skipping way ahead. First of all, we have we have his daughter uh, getting the princess from overprotective Dadocles. Yeah, he, he's getting she's getting her ready for, to be sacrificed. We still don't know what, but now she's just super on board with being sacrificed. And we hear mention of the Black Lotus, and like thanks to that, you are totally under my control. And like okay, I guess we're not showing, we're telling, but whatever. Right, so I'll do what you tell me to because reasons. Got it. Because you gave me a mind control drug. I didn't see it, but you've at least explained this enough that I know what's happening. Fuck it. Let's roll with it. Which is just sort of the theme of the movie, in my opinion. Yep. And then comes the worst mind control attempt ever. Well, so Hercules breaks into the compound and stands on an obvious trap door until a henchman runs over and pulls the lever that activates the trapdoor falls down into the dungeons, they chain him up, and then they s he sends his daughter down because he wants to mind control Hercules so that he and his daughter will breed super soldiers. Right, but here's the here's the weird part. She's told to mind control him with oh, yeah. the Black Lotus, which apparently is in uh -huh. this goblet, and it's either like a tea or some mm -hmm. kind of syrup. She walks up to sure. him drinks it explains that it's mind control serum drinks it herself wait <laughs> what and then hands it to him and says all right now it's your turn oh okay he just kind of looks like no and breaks out of his chains and starts beating up all the guards don't know what you thought was gonna happen yeah i'm right there with you i'm like what also shouldn't she be mind controlled right now <laughs> Worst mind control attempt ever. Also, all right, so the king tells her to use her feminine wiles to entice Hercules, and if that doesn't work, then use the Black Lotus because it's faster. 
She doesn't even try. She goes straight for Black Lotus. She's like, oh, damn, he's hot. Yeah, just use the Black Lotus. Make this easier. Yeah, this is going to take a while. I mean, he looks like he doesn't put out on the first date. And I mean, Bonanza's going to be on in like half an hour. <laughs> Bonanza. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So that fails miserably. Meanwhile, the king has his like villain monologue explaining everything. Right. So that's when we hard cut back to King Minos, takes the virgin. She's clearly mind controlled, so he he just explains everything. He's like, "So it turns yeah. out the whole time what he's been wanting to do with this sacrifice is to sacrifice I guess remember uh So if you remember the sword at the very beginning that he stole, He's been using... Which a lot of people forget because a lot of insane shit has happened between that and now. Right. That sword is actually keeping a phoenix in this volcano, which I don't know where this volcano came from because everything was just dark and green. Nothing was remotely volcano-like. But anyway, there's a volcano. He's trying... And there's some sort of weird rule that the phoenix isn't allowed to be higher than the sword at any point in time. As so he keeps it at, like, the base of the volcano so that the phoenix can't, like, rise higher than that. Right. But in order for the sword to work, because science, he has to make a sacrifice and put the blood on the sword once a year. No, he just has to lower a virgin into the lava. Oh, that's every right. Every year. That's right. To be the phoenix's bride. Man, I'm getting way too much stuff wrong. Anyway. <laughs> Fucking up left and right. It's unprofessional. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, he starts slowing her down as he explains all this, and then, yay, Hercules shows up to do the thing. He Lowering her on this, like, really, really slow crank. That he's, like, he's pedaling it pretty hard, and it's just, like, little inch, little, little more, little, little more. Oh, we're gonna get there eventually. <laughs> slow and steady wins the race, eh, crank? I think that was just another plot device to, to increase the duration oh, yeah. of the it's, movie. It's the villain unnecessarily slow dipping device. <laughs> but, but what I love about it is that it's clearly like some sort of 10 speed and he's got the gauge set so high. So he's just like pedaling like a crazy person and it's just inching along nice and slow. Like they could have just had him cranking at a reasonable speed and it going down slowly. Hell, but they, made they didn't even have to do that. To have him... Just cranking as hard as he can. They, they didn't even have to do that. They could have just been like, hey, look over that ledge for me. Push. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this whole also thing true. takes over like a death bridge with no rail. So it's just like, you know, if you slip, you fall to your death. Mm-hmm. But anyway, no, he has to use the unnecessarily slow dipping device. Plenty of time for Hercules to come back and be like, hey, I beat up your daughter. You're next. And he's like, oh no, I got the beep boop sword. The greatest beep boop sword that ever beep booped. Because it is made of flaming rainbows. And it beeps and boops. And so he slashes and it. And it beeps and boops. So he slashes and it. And it paints things on Hercules. <laughs> That's really actually quite impressive. Yeah. So he, like a couple of slashes and like you know, paints his arm, and apparently this is, like, the stingy kind of paint, because he's like, ooh, ow, ooh, that hurts. But, like, I'm okay, but that ow, though. I think it's supposed to be, like, this sword is burning him. No, it's definitely paint. I don't know what you're talking about. It's paint. <laughs> All right, yeah, no, it's covering him. It The sword is made of flaming rainbows that have the properties of stinging nettles. Yes. And so some something happens in the middle of it where they actually manage to like get on the other side of each other on this skinny death bridge. I mean, they're just slowly pushing Hercules back in this clandestine battle. Right, but he's, you know, the doorway's at one place, the sword... Yeah, I don't know how they manage to get turned around. They just kind of do for plot's sake. Yeah. And so he manages to grab the sword, and King Minus is like, No, my science! It's like, if you take that sword out of that hunk of gold over there, because, by the way, the sword is jammed into a giant, like, nugget of gold. Straight up Excalibur style. And like, if you take it out, then the phoenix escapes. And he basically says, well, whatever. Pulls it out. He's like, dude, I'm Hercules. 
slash it around a little bit more. I still don't know why he doesn't just throw him over the edge, but whatever, pushes him back. He makes one more lunge. Hercules throws the sword. No, 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 no. He just stabs the king. He throws the sword into the daughter. Oh, that's right. With, once again, Liam's ever so favorite, shthunk. Yes. That amazing, especially, he underhands the sword, too. <laughs> Hercules can't be troubled to raise the sword up to throw it. <laughs> doesn't have that kind of time to softball lob this into a villain. So he raises the princess up, saves her. The evil daughter is all like, I'll stop you, Hercules! And he hucks the sword into her, unfortunately not into space, and cue werewolf transformation scene number three. Into old bag of bones. I have zero idea why. It makes no sense. Like, they never established that she's, like, old or something? It... Well, see, this is this is why I didn't realize she was the daughter. This scene is partly responsible where I thought, oh, she must have been, like, an old god sorceress that's been around just forever and ever and taking advantage of Minos. Yeah. But if she's his daughter, I got nothing. I mean, they say that King Minos and his evil daughter, like, they say that a couple of times... So, but I, I just, I don't know. But yeah. I honestly think it was to kill more time. Probably. You're probably absolutely right now that I think about it. But yeah. Needless to say, he beats up all the bad guys. The volcano starts erupting. She manages to save the girl. They kiss. One more explosion for oh. good measure. No, no, no. Hang on. So, the entire city's on fire, and they run out back through the caves they came in there and they're watching it from the shoreline and they kiss and this was a close competitor for favorite scene or favorite line in the movie aside from the bear you can't beat the bear but this is better because he's about to kiss her and then stops like whoa whoa, whoa wait you a shapeshifter <laughs> how do i know you're, you're the a real shifter you gotta tell me no and then he's like and then she's like nowhere he's just like Hang on, hang on, hang on. She's like, are you the real daughter, or are you the enchantress, or are you the evil sorceress? And she's... And her response is, yeah, I'm a little bit of all of that. I am all of them, and I am none of them, because I love you, Mr. Hercules. And then they... They reach in and kiss. Their outline joins the constellation, and then explodes. (laughs) One more explosion, for good measure. You know, no... (laughs) No outro for Mr. Weird Narrator. No, like, like no closure with the gods. Just explosion, space, credits. <laughs> That's it. You make, Wait, what if, you right. make of it what you want. So, Whatever. When they kiss and their outline starts going up into the stars, I was about to turn the movie off. Because I'm like, all right, that's it, and then it's gonna roll credits at the end. I was like, hand just inches away from the mouse button to click it off, and then their outline explodes, and I fell over laughing. <laughs> I was so happy I stuck it out. I was tempted to watch through the entire credits just in case something else exploded for no reason at the very end of the movie. Yeah, post production. Oh. <sighs> So yeah, that's the whole movie. They just kind of they just kind of leave it hanging there at the end. So I've been teasing this kind of through the whole podcast so far, but I have a theory that if you really you know, if you really want to have a truly awful movie, it can't be a one-man show. It's got to be a team effort. And what I mean by that, when this movie was first originally made, remember how I mentioned that Andrew the Andrew Reeves version of Hercules was the very first kind of Hercules to try and capitalize on this. The original Uh director that was trying to basically piggyback off of that piggyback wanted to really overdo it. So he wanted to really up the action, really up the sex, basically out Hercules, Hercules. Okay. He gets fired from the project. New guy (laughs) comes in and says, yeah, this is great in concept, but I'm going to dumb down the, the action just a little bit and then even more sex 
And I'm going to bring in Lou Ferrigno because he's a big name that everybody knows. Lou Ferrigno, for whatever reason, has some stake held in this, so he makes directorial decisions. He decides to up the action again because he wants it to be a kid-friendly show. And then the person who plays King Minos' daughter also has an equal stake in it because I believe she was related to one of the directors at this point. And so she wanted to bring in a totally different direction as well. So basically, there are four different inputs trying to make something out of this movie, and it just clearly shows because no matter how serious this so, movie takes itself, it rips apart at the seams again and again and again. Okay, that makes so much sense because, like I said, this is the ramblings of a lunatic. Like, this movie feels schizophrenic, and that's actually because the writing is coming from four different people, all with four different completely different diametrically opposed visions of how this movie should be absolutely oh my god i'm so glad you told me that because that makes the lunacy of this movie make a lot more sense order out of chaos if you will <laughs> this movie starts in chaos and it ends in chaos and there must be perfect order i disagree i think it's kind of chaos just the whole way through beautiful mm -hmm. beautiful sweet chaos it's a train wreck. A lovely, wonderful, huckin' shit in the space train wreck. By far one of my all-time favorite, favorite terrible movies. But yeah, so I have a, yeah, so I have a theory that like just the truly bad movies, and we're gonna have to look as we go through. Either, I I really believe that it's a result of just too many chefs. I don't know, like what I really love in a so good it's bad or so bad it's good movie is when you can really tell that whoever made this piece of shit thought it was going to be the best thing ever. Yes. Like, a movie like Birdemic, where it's so ham-fisted in its message, and clearly the director, writer, producer, who I think is all the same person, uh, that guy thought that he was going to change the world with this film. And... Oh. It fails on such a grand scale. Well, and in that particular instance, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the the director for the movie actually went on public record saying that he was trying to make an honest reinterpretation of the birds. The birds. Yeah. Like he wanted. Yeah, I mean, like he wanted to make it an honest to goodness like successor to the birds. Like it was what he was trying to do in a very serious way, which is part of what makes it so good. Yeah, like. The people involved have to come into this thinking they're making gold. Okay. They, that's that's where the real beauty is. Like, I don't have time for people who know they're making shit. Like, those movies are trying too hard. It's not good. But if you honestly are behind this project 100% and then it fails miserably, those are the really good ones. The best. Whew, so that was, I think that's a wrap. I mean, it's a good place to stop. We had our review. We had some discussion about bad movies in general. I mean, what more do you want from us? God. How about a teaser? Damn. How about a teaser? <clears throat> oh. So, next month, I think we're going to talk about a movie that, ba it, I'll, I'm not going to say the title, but I'll give you a hint. It's usually like a section... Inside a house. Might be some corners in it. You usually access it through a door. <laughs> All right. So that's been Bad Movie Book Club for our second month, episode two, Hercules, 1983. Go find it. Watch Lou Ferrigno. Lift the things. Beat the toys. Act his pants off. By the way, no one wears pants in this movie. I should have also mentioned that. Didn't you know pants weren't invented until the middle, middle ages? <laughs> oh, God. All right. That's it. Go home, everybody. Until next time, boys and girls, watch more bad movies. <laughs> All right, oh, wait, 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 wait. Crap. Ah, more stuff. <laughs> more stuff. More things. Email us things. Gosh darn it. Yeah. We want your feedback on this. If there's a movie you're particularly interested in us reviewing, please, by all means, suggest it. We have a Facebook page, actually, Bad Movie Book Club. 
Yep. Uh, our email is watchbadmovies at gmail.com. Yep. If you have Twitter, go fuck yourself. <laughs> there, there's comments. Maybe down below. I shouldn't. No, yep, leave it comments. in. I love it. I love it. <laughs> fuck you, Twitter users. Bad Movie Book Club officially doesn't like Twitter. <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe if you want to make mention about our hating Twitter. <laughs> Oh my God. I've actually already, some people have personally reached out to me and uh, made some recommendations, which are already on our list. So I guess we've done good making our list. Good. Good. But still, recommend things. Absolutely. All right. Ah. See you so next I think that, month. I think that, cut it off. Good. Until next time, don't make us do your dirty work. Watch your own damn bad movies. There's nothing short of a masterpiece. The head is one big pile of shit.